All right, welcome everybody. Uh, some updates. Uh, we hope to have both live and Zoom meetings in February and March of next year. Uh, we have contracted for a meeting room and there will be details coming in emails and on the newsletter. Uh, but we will continue to Zoom at least through uh, May of 2022. Uh, so people will have a choice. Uh, and if everything goes uh, as well as we hope it does with COVID, we'll be doing uh, live meetings at least in February and March of next year. Uh, Tim has got a couple of uh, major events happening this month. Uh, and I think he's going to talk to us about both of those. Tim? Well, thank you, Harry. Yes, just two things. The Salem, Bur Salem Christmas Bird Count is this Saturday. So for those of you who have participated in the past, either uh, with uh, your feeder, you should have already see received your feeder form in the mail. I mailed those three or four days ago. And if you have been in the field in the past, um, your sector leaders should have contacted you. If you haven't heard from uh, either of those sources, please feel free to contact me at tim at salemautobahn.org or any of my other email addresses you know about, and I'll connect you with the appropriate person. So that's Saturday. We're going to have a scout at Mental Brown tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, um, rain or shine. So come pr prepared for that. And then um, we'll have our countdown event on Sunday at two o'clock through Zoom as we have in the past. So that's about that. And then the other thing I wanted to announce was that, uh, drum roll please, the Nature Center will be opening to the public on February the 5th for the first time ever. So um, that's, a, that's a landmark for us for sure. Um, and we will have, ceremony, we will have uh, people there to greet um, visitors for the first week. Um, and Pat and Bobby O'Leary, our, our volunteer coordinators at the Nature Center are gonna be coordinating that. If you'd like to take place, if you'd like to take part in those, in those, um, in those events uh, that first week, uh, please contact. Uh, Pat and Bobby, and you can reach them at volunteers at, at Ankeny Hill Nature Center org. Volunteer at Ankeny Hill Nature Center org. So both those that that information will be in the um, January Kestrel. So there will be some orientations in early January uh, that you can sign up for, and then. Um, and then be um, get the information you'll need to participate in the opening on February, on February the fifth. So now I'll turn it over to. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. When you mentioned the eight o'clock Mitchell tomorrow Wednesday, what parking lot are you planning to? Oh, meet at? that's a good question. Parking lot three, parking Thank lot you. three. Uh, so that's the end of the road uh, uh, going into the park. Thank you. And now to tell you about field trips, upcoming field trips, uh, I'll turn you over to Cynthia. I mean, over to, uh, yeah, Cynthia Donald. Hi, I'm just gonna uh, give a quick rundown of some of our upcoming field trips in January. Uh, more detailed information uh, will be in the Kestrel that will be coming out soon. Uh, January 5th, we have another uh, field trip at Minto Brown, parking lot three. That start time for that one is nine o'clock. We will be at Ankeny um, on January 16th. Start time for that one is also nine. We have a field trip to Lincoln City and Point South on January the 14th. And that meeting time I believe is also nine. And we have finally on the uh, 24th of January, we have a trip to the St. Louis uh, fish ponds and that start time is also at nine. In addition, there's a um, January 29th, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Willamette Valley Bird Symposium that's put on through um, OSU. So, and as I said, information, more detailed information about all that will be um, in the January Kestrel. For those of you who may not be Salem Audubon members, you can access the Kestrel on our website. It's very easy to do. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy. 
Thank you. Um, I am uh, Kathy Patterson. I am delighted to introduce Cynthia Donald. Um, she has uh, been active in many other Audubon societies in, in New Mexico and uh, Arizona before Sam Audubon. We are very fortunate because not only is Cynthia a member, she's also chair of the Field Trip Committee um, and coordinator, and she's also serving on the board of the Friends of the Willamette Valley Refuges um, and active for planning the, the new um, Ankeny Hill Nature Center. Um, Cynthia has, has been a world traveler. Um, my gosh, she's been to numerous countries, uh, but in from August 28th to September 10th of 2013, um, Cynthia was fortunate enough to travel to southern France um, and the Pyrenees and a part of Europe that she hadn't visited before. And she started in the lovely old city of Montpelier. Um, and then she uh, was doing that three days before her tour started. Um, and then uh, with the group, she traveled east to um, the uh, Camar and a bit further east to the Steppe region before turning west and heading into the Great the Pyrenees Mountains. So her birding um, birds of that trip are um, shorebirds in the, the original, the first area, um, all the way to montane and mountain species in the Pyrenees. So we are delighted to have um, Cynthia give this program. We've never had a program uh, for the Camar and the Pyrenees in any region in France. So please welcome Cynthia to give her program tonight from the Camar and the Great and the Pyrenees Mountains. Thank you. Go ahead, Cynthia. Okay, I'm gonna see about sharing my screen. See then she can just put her screen on screen. Okay, let's go. Mm. There we go. All right, so a couple of um, things for me to acknowledge. First of all, um, I did not take any of the photos of the birds that you're going to see. And the reason for that is that a lot of people have not seen a number of these species. Um, all the photos that are in the program are um, in, public, in the public domain. Um, and I tried to get and well, look for and find some of the best examples uh, that I could in the public domain. Um, secondly, I will be asking some questions of you guys uh, during the program. And please, if you know the answer, please put it in the chat and we will check that out um, at the end. Some of the, some of the um, questions will be revealed as we go on. So my first question is, I have two unidentified birds on this cover slide, this first slide. And um, these two birds are the reason I went on this trip. Um, and if anyone knows what they are, uh, please put that in the chat. So we're gonna start um, our visit to Southern France um, down in a city, a very old city that's called uh, Montpellier. Lovely old city, established in the late 10th century initially, but came into great prominence during the um, 1100s. From there, we're going to move east to the Camargue and the Crow Steppe. And once we're done there, we will go back to Montpellier up in the Pyrenees and finish. And it's not really a terribly long program. Um, I've divided the slides of both the birds and the and the animals, as well as the scenery, um, into two parts. The first one obviously deals with Montpellier, the Camargue, and the Crow. And then the second part is up in the Pyrenees. Um, I just thought it would be too confusing to have um, everything all in one big jumble because you have totally different uh, habitats, totally different um, uh, ki kinds of birds and, and other animals that live there. So along the bottom of this, you can see this little red line and hopefully follow my cursor. 
this is where we were. It's a very tiny part of France. Um, the city of Montpellier is right here. And that's where we started. Then we went east to the Camargue and then to the Crow. And then we came back through that and up into the Pyrenees, which are right over here. And actually, we actually popped into Spain briefly. This is an aerial view of the uh, old part of Montpellier. And here's in the 11th century. Sorry. I'm sorry. It's I heard talking. Is there a question? Apparently not. Okay, here's another photograph, a close-up of the old part of the city of Montpellier. This area right in here is the uh, Place de la Comédie. Um, and this lovely uh, tree line boulevard is the Esplanade Charles de Gaulle. And over on the right is a close up ground level photograph of that Esplanade. And here you have a ground level photograph of the Place de la Comédie, including the uh, Théâtre, the Cinema Gaumont on the right. And you can tell from the um, from the dress that this is summer, everybody's out in shorts and cotton shirts and just having a great time walking around. At the other end of the Place de la Comédie is the opera. Um, and then further down in the city is the ancient uh, Montpellier Cathedral. You can see the whole different type of architecture there that the city has experienced during its many, many, many years of being an important uh, city in the south of France. Up here, the upper left is the uh, Port de Pérou. Uh, this is a triumphal arch that was built. Um, the lower left is the International Theater of Dance. And the right photo is the Tour de Pain. And that is the only remaining original tower that was part of the old walled city that was constructed um, in the 10 hundreds. Traveling east from that lovely old city, we're going to come out to the Camargue. And this is the largest uh, river delta in Western Europe. And it's formed by two different branches of the Rhone River. Uh, one of them comes down right here at this point. And the second one comes right down here at the very lower right part of the screen. So it's this really long, long, long um, uh, delta that you can see just has all this wonderful, um, all this wonderful environment in it. The Crow Step is east of here. It's a totally different um, environment, as you can see from this photo, these two photos. This is an, the Crow is an ancient uh, alluvial fan. Um, and it is just basically what you see right here. So you'll notice that there are these stone piles, rock piles, that are all over the Crow Step. This one, the lower left, is a, is a um, close-up of one of those. So here's my question number two. If anybody knows or thinks, wants to guess as to what these might be, please put your um, question in the uh, chat. And at some point, I will tell you what they are. We spent our first four days of this trip out of this, based on this lovely old French farmhouse, the Mas de la Finure. And you can tell how very flat everything is there. It's very lush, it's very warm. It's a very low elevation. The right is of course, just an um, enlargement photo of the entry to that farmhouse. Now, the Camargue is famous for three things. The first thing it's famous for are the large numbers of uh, greater flamingo, and we did see those. Uh, the second thing it's famous for are these beautiful white horses, which we did not look for and did not see. And the third thing it's famous for are its bulls, and we did not look for, nor did we see them. But we did see a lot of greater flamingos. Here's some of the um, grebes we saw there. 
black neck grebe, obviously, um, in our country is called the um, eared grebe, but also great crested little grebe, which is also known as a dab chick. Gray lag goose and red crested potchard. White stork, black stork, and glossy ibis. I was personally surprised to see glossy ibis over there in southern France. I knew they were in the US, but I had no idea that they were there. Purple heron, gray heron, and squaco heron. Um, all three of these birds are very widely distributed in Eurasia. We were surprised to find Egyptian vultures. Uh, the photo on the left is an adult. The photo on the right is a, um, a juvenile bird, youngster. And we actually saw an adult with the juvenile bird as they were moving through. Common buzzard, which would be a beauty o hawk in, um, in the United States, in North America, and European honey buzzard. Eurasian marsh harrier, and then Montague's harrier. Montague's has the same um, sexual dimorphism that our uh, northern harrier has. We are, I guess, the only continent that only has one harrier. Most of the others have multiple types of harriers. Red kite and Eurasian sparrowhawk. And if you look closely, you can see that this Eurasian sparrowhawk is standing on some poor little snack he's dispatched. And we will get a, a view of a living one of these birds a little later on. But if anybody has any clue as to what that is, <clears throat> that can also go into the chat. Here are some of the um, grassland birds that we encountered there. The little bustard, northern lapwing, red-legged partridge, known in, the, in North America as a chucker, uh, Eurasian dotterel, and stone curlew. The other name for the stone curlew is the Eurasian thickney. Three different plovers, Kentish plover, common ringed, and little ringed. Black wing stilt and pied abacet, both lovely, lovely birds. And here are some of the larger waders, the common green shank, common sandpiper, common red shank, and green sandpiper. And again, all these birds are in the Camaric region. And then we've got the Dunlin, <clears throat> excuse me, curlew, sandpiper, Eurasian curlew, little stent and ruff. This is a female ruff. That's the only um, part of that bird we saw. This is the um, slender billed gull at the upper right, I mean, upper left, excuse me, Mediterranean gull on the right, black headed gull, and yellow legged gull. Three of the four are just exquisitely beautiful birds. Here's some terns. Whiskered tern, black tern, little tern, common tern, Caspian tern, and the sandwich tern. And I always like the sandwich tern because the tip of their bill looks as if it's been dipped in mayonnaise. Three different uh, columbid species, the common wood pigeon, Eurasian collared dove, and the rock pigeon. Two different owl species. We were surprised to find a Eurasian eagle owl. They're not always, um, not always expected for sure. And the little owl, which was a delightful bird to find. Um, we do have an owl that is the same genus as the little owl in North America. And that's the little owl, not the one on the left. So if you know what owl that is, please put that in the chat and I'll give you a clue or a hint. Uh, the genus name is Athene and that is because 
uh, this what, and you might, re might remember that Athena was also um, the same name as Minerva. Um, and she was the goddess of wisdom. She was always pictured with an owl, always with a little owl. It's called um, Minerva's Owl. Here's four pretty cool looking birds here. Common kingfisher, European bee eater, Eurasian hoopoe, and the European roller. Three woodpeckers. And I'll tell you, the green is knock your socks off, gorgeous, gorgeous bird. But, uh, you know, the black woodpecker's not too shabby. It's pretty, pretty big bird, pretty impressive. And then, of course, the great spotted is just really lovely with all of its different colors. But the green is just a pretty cool bird. I mean, you don't see that many birds that are that color. Two different strikes. Red-backed and southern gray. Four members of the corvid family, the carrion crow, jackdaw, Eurasian magpie, and the Eurasian jay. Three different lark species, the calandra lark, crusted lark, and the skylark, where it actually belongs. I know it's in some portions of North America, but it was brought over here, introduced over here. Two different swallows. I was surprised we only found two different swallows down uh, at that elevation. I would have thought we would have had more, but we had bank and barn. And four, four warblers there. Um, actually, there's more than four. Um, this only has four to show right now. Uh, and these warblers have um, lovely songs. And as you can tell from the slide, they're pretty drab looking uh, birds. They are not related to our warblers at all, which are gorgeous and have kind of a nah, okay song, but nothing like these guys all have beautiful, beautiful song. Anyway, we had Seti's warbler, Melodious warbler, Eurasian reed warbler, and the willow warbler. And th for other warblers, Benelli's, the Sardinian, one of my favorites. It's just a real perky little guy. He's just cute. And with that red eye, he really stands out. Spectacled warbler. And then the Zitting Cysticola. So here we have some flycatchers. We have a spotted flycatcher at the upper left, the European pied, the northern, northern wheat ear, and the wind chat. Some of the wagtail families, we had Western yellow wagtail, tree pippet, and tawny pippet. And then some other really cool birds, the European goldfinch is just stunning. And the corn bunting is plain, but a very cool little bird in its own right. And then Eurasian tree sparrow. We did not see common house sparrow. Two different mammals, European brown hare and European red squirrel. So that takes you through um, that part of Southern France. Again, it's very low and quite warm. And here we are moving back west from Montpellier. We'll go past uh, the lovely old city of Carcassonne before heading up into the Pyrenees. And upper left is a view of the city of Carcassonne, and that is an old ancient walled city. We sat and had a picnic lunch and got to look at it. It was just beautiful. So once we left the plains, we moved up into the Pyrenees and it is just dramatic. They're very dramatic mountains. They are gorgeous mountains. They are cool and cold. Uh, and I will remind you that we were there um, the end of August, the beginning of September. So it was warm every place else, except, of course, when you're up elevation. 
and we base most of our time out of the Jed region. And um, this lower picture here is a view from um, my room in Jed. They're just some um, shots of different parts of the Pyrenees. You can see it's some, day, some days cloudy, some days overcast, some days light rain, but very dramatic scenery. Um, the lower left is the Cirque, the Hotel du Cirque, and the right is actually the Cirque de Gavarni. And those of you who might remember um, your uh, geology, um, a Cirque is basically a bowl shaped that has an outlet at one end, and it is the headland of a glacier which would explain why the sides of it are so incredibly steep and why there is this outlet down here, because that's where the glacier climbed down that mountain. Here's some more views of uh, different parts of, um, of the Pyrenees. We went up to an area that's called the Col du Tumale, and there is this uh, very large statue called Le Géant du Tourmalet. And this was uh, Octavo Lapiz, who was the winner of the 1910 uh, Tour de France. And the reason he's memorialized here is because that was the year, the first year that this particular route and the, the coal area had been included in the Tour de France. And you can see this, you know, he won this in 1910. You can see the lower um, right shows you what the road is like, how narrow it is. And again, this was, you know, 2013, it's over hundred years later. So heaven only knows what the road conditions were at the time that, um, that he was making that, that run. And the upper right is, shows how very, very steep the, the hills and uh, down into the valleys still are. One of the other parts of the Pyrenees we went up to is called the uh, Port de Bouchardeau or Bouchardeau. Um, and this is actually takes you up to Mont Perdu, which is the dividing line between um, France and Spain. And here I am standing on the Spanish side of this rock that is uh, the border between the two countries. We hiked up this valley on this very, very old, old trail. Uh, and it's an important trail uh, because it was actually used by the French resistance in World War II. Um, and this is the trail that they would take um, allied, normally it was allied um, airmen who had been shot down and they would walk them um, to safety, relative safety in Spain. Of course, they were only safe as long as they could avoid uh, Franco's guys, because otherwise they'd just be sent right back um, into uh, the Vichy controlled part of France, which was very sympathetic to the Germans. But again, you can see how lovely, you know, that just beautiful, beautiful scenery, gorgeous mountain, but very cold and very steep. And here's some of the things we saw there. Booted eagle, Lammergeier. So if you guessed Lammergeier or bearded vulture as one of the first two photos, um, you got it. Congratulations, you got it correct. Golden eagle was there. Golden eagles are amazing. They are completely in the Northern hemisphere and they occur in every single country that is in the Northern hemisphere or they can occur in that. And we also saw lots of uh, Eurasian griffin. Ah, uh, another question. If you know what is special about the Lammergeier's diet, please put it in the chat. We have both uh, species of chuff, yellow billed and red billed. And again, these birds are only at high elevation. Eurasian kestrel, and Eurasian hobby were also up there flying around. Common raven, another widespread um, species. The rhinek, 
the Eurasian crag martin and common house martin. So if you know what family the rhine neck belongs to, please pop that in the chat. Here are five of the little darling tits that we found. Coal tit, crested tit, Eurasian blue tit, long-tailed tit, and great tit. And the long-tailed tit is an interesting little bird. Actually, all birds in the long-tailed tit group are interesting. Um, they are not very closely related to the other tits. And we do have a species in North America that is related to the long-tailed tit, and that is the bush tit. Eurasian nuthatch, wall creeper, and short-toed tree, tree creeper were, all, were up there. So if you got wall creeper down as that other bird on the uh, initial slide, congratulations. Um, that is just a stunning, stunning bird. Well, they all are, but that one is particularly. We came across firecrest, goldcrest, and where we had water, we had a dipper, a white-throated dipper. Now, the goldcrest is in the same um, genus as our uh, golden crown kinglet is. So obviously it looks very, very similar. And here's some of the warblers we found at that high elevation. Garden warbler, black cap, common chiff chaff, and the greater white throat. Two different red starts, the common red start and black red start, European robin, and the European stone chat. And obviously the robin this European robin is not a thrush, as ours is. Alpine accentor, dunnock, water pipit, white wagtail, and the western gray wagtail were also up there. The accentor and dunnock were up at very high elevations. Yellowhammer, rock bunting. Eurasian linnet, just a lovely, lovely little bird. Citral finch, common chaffinch, and European sarin. And if you remember what that European sparrow hawk was standing on, it was a common chaffinch that it had dispatched. And it was getting ready to um, defeather and, and eat. And these were the three uh, mammals we found up there. The alpine marmot in very good numbers. The cirque sheep, which obviously is not wild, but they're everywhere. And the Perian um, chamois or chamois, as it's called in the United States. But this is an interesting, interesting animal. So, that is it. I will leave you with these images. Most of them are of um, spots in the Pyrenees, uh, except for the one at the lower left that is in Montpellier. So I will say merci bien and gracias, and I'm ready for questions that you guys might have. So I think John was going to do questions. Is that right, John? Unmuted. So I don't see any in the question column, but back in the chat, uh, we, have, we have Michael Babbitt who uh, volunteered an answer for the, the stone piles, I think. Um, um, you like to... Uh, Michael, you want to say what you said and uh, see what Cynthia I has to can, say? I'm reading what he said. He <laughs> says, farmers clearing the fields. I love it. Um, well, that's a great guess. 
you remember um, in World War II, um, there was a lot of paranoia from the um, Axis countries uh, about being invaded. This is a huge flat uh, alluvial plain out there. And uh, Adolf Hitler was concerned that the Americans or the allies were going to be coming in in glider planes and landing all these glider planes in, in this big open field area. I'm not quite sure um, if that was even a realistic concern, but he was concerned about it nonetheless. And so what happened is the uh, Vichy French used um, allied prisoners of war and had them construct all these piles of rock to thwart any kind of uh, glider invasion landing that might occur down there in Southern France. Well, oh, that's an interesting way to put in anti-glider uh, <laughs> barriers. Well, yeah. again, I'm not sure what, this is World War II, I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure what, um, how much uh, payload that glider planes would have been able to... Um, they could have some pretty big gliders that could carry Jeeps and small trucks, I believe. Well, um, I, but you got to get them up in the air. Oh, and yeah, in order they, to get them in, in order to get them in the air, you got to have a plane to fly them. I mean, yeah. we weren't going to have planes leaving out of Spain. I don't know where they were going to take off that they could land there, but whatever. That's a good point. North Africa? I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Maybe they uh, jumped oh, off the Pyrenees. Well, you'd have to get there. Yeah, you know? That's true. You got to get your plane up there. Franco, I mean, you got to remember, Franco was not sympathetic to the Allies. The Vichy French were not sympathetic to the Allies. The Germans certainly weren't. So, I mean, you, you got hostile territory everywhere you went. They would have had to come from North Africa, Morocco, Libya, yeah. Algeria. They'd driven the Germans out by then. Yes, that's true. They might have a range from England if uh, some of the planes are, could go quite a ways. But anyway, yeah, interesting speculations there. So Barb oh. says that uh, the Lammergeier takes its prey and drops it to break its bones so it can eat it all. Um, that is partially correct. Lammergeier actually eats bones. It eats the marrow out of bones. It swallows bones whole. It does not eat meat. Um, it is the only vulture in the world that does that. And it is, you know, as I said, there were two, two birds I went on this trip to see. One was the uh, Lammergeier, the other one was the wall creeper because they're unique. Wow, I'd say so. Eat bones. Um, then um, next one that I see is Paul Evans about asking about geese. Did you see any? Uh, only the gray leg. Uh huh. Marish Midgall says, "What tour company did you travel with?" You um, I traveled with um, field guides. Any comments about it? Oh, I love them. They're one of the tour groups I go with if I'm in a, I have, of course, I haven't been anywhere for two years, uh -huh. um, but I have like several tour groups I go with. They're one of my favorites. Great. Mary Lucky says, at what elevation were you and what is the highest of uh, the most birds would go? Um, the highest Double elevation percent. up there is going to be at Mont Perdu. I'm going to have to um, Google that. And I'll do that. I'll find my phone. So let's, I'll, I'll do that maybe at the end. Is that the last one? Yeah. All right, that's the last one I see. Maybe Harry can tell us about some of those birds that fly over the Himalayas and stuff like that about how high and some there birds There is a go. question in the Q and A. Uh, Lynn oh. asked what, uh, what food was, was the food was, was the food as good as birdie? <laughs> oh, the food was exceptional. And I was going to say, I normally take photos of food. This is like the one and only trip I've ever been on where I didn't take food photos. And um, now that I'm back and it's eight years on, I'm like, I should have taken photos. We had fabulous food. Absolutely. You, you know, you're in Southern France. My goodness. Yeah. Food yeah. is incredible. 
One of the things Cynthia and I talked about, Montpellier is where if you're a foodie, you've heard of MFK Fisher, one of the most important American food writers. That's where she got introduced to France. She lived in Montpellier as a young woman, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago, something like that. Uh, and they, that area down there, if if you've ever heard of the stuff that they make out of grapes, uh, what is that stuff, wine? Uh, some of the stuff like <laughs> Cote de Rhone, Gigandas, Chateauneuf de Pop, Languedoc. I mean, the list of fine wines that you can find in southern France is longer than both your arms put together. So you're going to eat and drink very well when you're there. Oh. Well, thank you very much, Cynthia. Do you have any more? Anybody else have any more questions? No. Well, I, just have, I did I just have, have I did have uh, some some information about the elevations. The higher the higher elevation. Um, it's about um, almost 3,000 meters. So that's 9,000. That's about, that's about 10, 11,000, 10,000 feet. 10,000 feet. 9,000. 9, yeah. 9,000. 3,000 meters, 9,000 feet. Yeah. I'll just add a couple of quick comments about the Camargue. It is near a wonderful city called Arles, where some weird yes. Dutchman by the name of Van Gogh lived and painted and, uh, uh, much of the, many of the cafes and stuff. It's a magnificent city with a lot of old Roman ruins that you can walk through for hours without getting bored. And nearby is a city, a walled city called Egg Mort, which is still inside the walls, it was built in the 10th century. It is the most, one of the most incredible relics of the medieval Paris or me medieval France that you can find anywhere. And it's right there on the coast within about a 15 minute drive of the Camargue. And one of the animals that Cynthia didn't mention, which is in the Camargue that you may not see unless you drive around at night, gigantic wild pigs oh. are quite common. <laughs> and you see their, their runs in the, in the marsh where they've pushed the bushes aside and made these things so they can belly slide into the mud from the top of the levees. And you see these, I guess they call them pig slides. I don't know what you call them in French. Uh, where the pigs come in and out of the marsh and run around and feed, uh, but they're mostly nocturnal because they, they know better than to get out in the public where they can be seen in the daytime. But we saw a lot of the cattle just standing right along the road when we were there. I did have one additional, um, one additional thing. I asked about the little owl and I also asked what family the Rhineck is in, if anybody knew. Uh, the Rhineck, even though it spends the great majority of, of its time on the ground, is in the woodpecker family. Hmm. And the little owl, our Athene owl, is the uh, burrowing owl. Hmm. It's the only one that we have in North America in that, in that family. Or in that, excuse me, not that family, in that, um, that genus. So... I don't think I ask any other questions. Nope, according to my notes, I didn't. So you guys did well on the quiz. Thanks for playing. Well, thanks so much for all the splendid description as Barb says and uh, great presentation. Well, it was short because it wasn't a long trip, but it was fun. And if you ever get a chance to go, mm. um, go. Southern France. Um, I had lived in um, southern Germany for three years, and I was like, France? Eh, who wants to go to France? But um, the Pyrenees, I've always been fascinated by mountains, and the Pyrenees just, I thought, well, you know, let's go there and see what we find, and I was just blown away. I loved it. It was a great, great trip. Yeah, well, it sure sounds like it. Thank you. Again. All right.